1995, Disney released a movie in which a summer camp for overweight boys goes bankrupt and is immediately bought out by a psychotic fitness entrepreneur played by Ben Stiller. Everything fun and wholesome about the camp is quickly destroyed, and the campers are thrown into an extensive fitness regimen that will be recorded and turned into a weight loss infomercial. The film was heavyweights, and even though it has the Disney name slapped onto its poster, this movie was miles ahead of other comedies released by the studio during that time, mostly thanks to a script co-written by Judd Apatow, who became synonymous with raunchy comedy blockbusters less than a decade later. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at everything that made Heavyweights so great, its transformation from box office bomb to full-blown cult classic, and the influence the movie had on entertainment going forward. Attention campers, lunch has been cancelled today due to lack of hustle. Deal with it. Sometime in the early 90s, Steve Brill approached Judd Apatow with an idea that he had for a movie about a summer magic camp. But through just casual conversation and brainstorming, the idea was reworked to instead focus on a summer camp for overweight boys. At that point, the film was conceptualized as sort of a spiritual successor to the movie Meatballs, with a working title of Fat Camp and a PG-13 rating in mind. Adam Sandler and Chris Farley were asked to star as a pair of camp counselors in the movie, but turned down the offer pretty much immediately. Once that happened, it was decided that the idea would be reworked to aim for a younger demographic, and the working title Fat Camp was thrown out in favor of heavyweights. Judd Apatow then pitched the idea to Joe Roth at the Disney-owned Caravan Pictures, who agreed to produce the movie without even seeing a script for it, and that's because it actually hadn't even been written yet. When Heavyweights was pitched, Steve Brill was a screenwriter with two Mighty Ducks films under his belt, and Judd Apatow built up a solid reputation as a writer on both The Ben Stiller Show and The Larry Sanders Show. So it's pretty easy to understand why this movie was greenlit without a physical script for the studio to look over. With the production company locked down, Steve and Judd got to work on the script for Heavyweights. Right out of the gate, the main villain of the movie, Tony Perkis, was written with Ben Stiller in mind. Who would like to own up to this treasure trove? Hmm? Whose wonderful candies are these? Oh, orange. look! A deli meat! Ben was at a bit of a crossroads between acting and directing at that time, so with that in mind, he agreed to play the part of Tony Perkis, as long as he wasn't included in any of the marketing materials, such as trailers or posters. This was also co-writer Steve Brill's directorial debut, so it was a no-brainer for him to bring in some of the young actors from the Mighty Ducks movies that he previously wrote, the first of which being Aaron Schwartz, who played the main character in Heavyweights, Jerry Garner. The film opens up seconds before school is let out for summer break, and other than Dave's and Confused, this is probably the most accurate representation of the excitement felt on the last day of school. Jerry misses his bus and is forced to walk home, and without any dialogue, we understand exactly who this kid is. Dogs are out to get him for absolutely no reason, and he can't throw a baseball for his life, but he can chug a pitcher of lemonade in a matter of seconds. When Jerry gets home, he's greeted by his parents and this dude who is there to show him a promotional tape for a summer camp. Jerry, no, he's gonna send your ass to Camp Green Lake to dig some holes. Get out of there, bro. This promotional tape for Camp Hope promises go-karts, rope swings, and this sick water catapult called the Blob. And by the way, the manufacturer of these things still references heavyweights on their website 28 years after the fact. I guess a reference to Jackass 3D wouldn't really fit their customer demographic. But Jerry is enthusiastic about the camp until he uh, starts putting two and two together. Jerry's parents force him to go to camp, and on the plane ride there, he meets fellow camper Roy, played by Keenan Thompson. Jerry's sarcastic humor definitely appealed to me as a kid and still does now. You're fatter than I am. Why don't you go to the camp? You show your father some respect. But Keenan's comedic sensibilities set the tone for heavyweights. This is where the movie really begins to find its footing. Headed to the back camp. Oh. Why do you say that? Because you're fat. Oh, well, so are you. I know. That's why I'm going to fat camp. Once they land, Jerry and Roy join the other campers on a bus ride to Camp Hope. After meeting the camp counselors and settling into the chipmunk bunk, we're introduced to Josh, played by Sean Weiss. By the time that I watched Heavyweights, I had seen the first two Mighty Ducks films. Goldberg was always my favorite character in those movies, and the Josh character is easily just as funny. The first line he delivers in the movie has lived in my head rent-free for over two decades. Roy, I just saw the new nurse and... Uh... She's very attractive. This pleases me. 
This is also where another one of my favorite scenes in the movie goes down, where the campers unload all of the junk food they smuggled in. Come on over here! Get these salamis off my back! They really hurt! Things feel relatively predictable for the first 10 to 15 minutes. Like, you kind of have an idea of where this is going. But the plot turns on its head when the owners of Camp Hope, played by Ben Stiller's actual parents by the way, rest in peace, step on stage and deliver some bad news. Sometimes in life things don't work out the way you plan. And you file chapter 9 bankruptcy. <laughs> This is where Ben Stiller's character is introduced, and it's hilarious that he didn't want to be shown on any of the promotional materials for the movie, because to simply say that he was method acting would be an understatement. He went all in for this role, working out with a trainer for four hours a day, curling dumbbells between takes, tweezing his eyebrows, dyeing his hair black, waxing his body hair, and it was definitely worth it because he looked like an absolute madman. Tony brings in a regime of new counselors that he refers to as Team Perkis and quickly replaces the counselor of the chipmunk bunk, Pat, with a Scandinavian man named Lars. Now, let's play the fun game that helps us learn each other's names. We already know each other's names. Silence! <laughs> His first interaction with the kids is easily one of the funniest scenes in the movie. And I am Lars. <laughs> Lars? What kind of name is that? Where are you from? Far away. The following morning, Tony essentially transforms Camp Hope into, as Judd Apatow described it, a prison camp for overweight boys, with the intention of turning them into a bunch of skinny winners. By the end of the summer, this camp is going to be filled with skinny winners. Skinny wieners? <laughs> you hear that, guys? Kenny the Cameraman, played by Alan Covert, who ended up being one of Adam Sandler's go-to guys in the years that followed, is documenting the boys' weight loss journey for an infomercial. But with his perm and the dangly earring, is it just me or does he look like he would just make some absolutely fire TikTok videos? After an embarrassing baseball game against the neighboring camp MVP, Heavyweights, which up to this point in the runtime was already pretty dark for a Disney comedy, delivers its darkest moment yet. Tony raids the boys' cabin for all of their junk food, Shawshank Redemption style, and Josh drops a line that was clearly censored by Disney. Candy belongs to Seymour Butts. Seymour Butts? Who's Seymour Butts, hmm? Who's seen more butts? Nobody's seen more butts than you, Uncle Tony. <laughs> Tony is laughed out of the room, and the scene ends with this really ominous white fade effect to sort of imply that Josh is going to possibly die. And the next day, the boys wake up to see his bed empty. Good morning, campers. Joshua Birnbaum is no longer with us. So obviously, Heavyweights has a much darker sense of humor compared to other Disney comedies of its day. And I didn't even get to the scene where the boys tie up a bunch of counselors and lock Tony inside of an electrified cage. <sighs> Unfortunately, when the completed film was presented to Disney, they found that Heavyweights didn't quite fit in with other Disney comedies of the time. As a result, the marketing department didn't have the slightest idea of how they were going to promote this movie. And so they just sort of didn't. During an interview with Sam Roberts in 2015, Judd recalled that prior to the theatrical release of Heavyweights, there were no promotional interviews, no press junkets, no talk show appearances, nothing. A promotional trailer was made and some posters were displayed at theaters, but that was about it. In the United States, the first few months of the year at the box office are referred to as dump months, as that's typically the time in which studios release films that they don't have a lot of confidence in. Well, Heavyweights was one of those movies opening alongside Just Cause and the Brady Bunch movie on February 17th, 1995. And Heavyweights underperformed alongside those movies by millions of dollars. Critical reviews for the movie were pretty lukewarm, and specifically Siskel and Ebert, who had the ability to make or break box office success, weren't too enthusiastic about heavyweights. Also, Ben Stiller signing on as Tony Perkis, but specifically requesting not to appear in any marketing materials, definitely did not help. The TV commercials that still exist for this movie are just not that great, because without Ben Stiller, they disregard the biggest plot point in the film. Although he was eventually added to the trailers that played on other Disney VHS tapes that were released in the mid-90s. But Disney never really tried to hide this movie from the public eye, because just a few years after its release, Heavyweights began airing regularly on the Disney Channel. We're gonna turn this summer into the number one weight loss infomercial in the country! Now, they've gotta take on their counselors and take back their camp. We'll reach the point, no return. Ben Stiller starts in the movie that proves bigger is better. 
Heavyweights. Coming I'm not sure about any of you, but this is the way that I discovered Heavyweights. And even as a dumb eight-year-old who had only seen a handful of movies, witnessing this film for the first time in the early 2000s made me feel like I struck comedy gold. After a successful run on cable TV, Disney released the film on Blu-ray, and this is, even to this day, just one of the best physical media releases that a big studio has ever put out. The deleted scenes reveal a lot about the movie that Heavyweights could have been if Disney hadn't censored a lot of the film. What I mean is, there are about a thousand d jokes that were left on the cutting room floor. And the way he wrote it, and I remember being on set and them telling us about notes that they would get from, from Disney, mm -hmm. being like, you can't do that, and you can't do this. But whether or not you like, love, or hate this movie, it had a big influence on entertainment in the years that followed its release. I'm not just talking about the fact that Judd and a lot of individuals both on and off screen continued to work together on future projects. That's not surprising at all. But if you've seen the 2004 movie Dodgeball, you probably remember the character of White Goodman, played by Ben Stiller. Listen closely now, this is serious. I believe that White Goodman from Dodgeball and Tony Perkis from Heavyweights are in fact the same person. Near the end of Heavyweights, Tony Perkis has a mental breakdown and his father, the lighting fixture king of Western Pennsylvania, Tony Perkis Sr., also played by Ben Stiller, has him hauled away from Camp Hope. Tony isn't seen again until a post credit scene where it's revealed that he's turned to door-to-door -to -door healing crystal sales. Feeling dead inside after being rejected by so many customers, I believe that Tony packed his bags, changed his name, convinced his dad to give him some startup money, and moved to the West Coast to start Globo Gym. In Dodgeball, he does refer to his father as Earl Goodman, but it's very possible that some wires were crossed in his brain after knocking himself out at the end of Heavyweights, which also explains why his character is significantly dumber in Dodgeball. Oh, I don't think I'm a lot dumber than you thought that I think that I thought I was once. Now, I'm not going to try and take credit as the first person to kick this theory around, but with a sequel to Dodgeball on the way, I would love it if they could somehow confirm this connection to the fans within that movie. Heavyweights, on the other hand, will most likely never receive a sequel or remake, and this pleases me. When the movie first came out, a lot of critics viewed it as a lowbrow film that poked fun at overweight kids. But Heavyweights is really about accepting yourself for who you are and rolling with the punches that life will inevitably throw at you, with just a few jokes about farts and butts along the way. Kiss my butt! Oh my! Oh my! <laughs> but that'll do it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you watched Heavyweights back in the day or if you plan to now that you've seen this video. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.